Hello and welcome everyone to this podcast for cell biology. In this podcast, we're going to talk about the citric acid cycle. And towards the end, we'll also talk about a special pathway called gluconeogenesis. But for the most part, we're going to focus on citric acid cycle. You might have also heard this called the TCA cycle for tricarboxylic acid cycle. And you might have also heard it as the Krebs cycle. It's all the same cycle. Sometimes um, names change for various reasons. And we're going to focus and call it the citric acid cycle in this class. I want to begin with a discussion, brief one, about acetyl coenzyme A and why this is important. Acetyl CoA A has the molecular structure of this. It is important because it is this acetyl CoA A that enters into the citric acid cycle. As we'll learn in a moment, the citric acid cycle produces several NADH molecules and an FADH2 molecule, which is important for electron transport and for the production of the considerable amount of ATP that's produced in a cell. But we'll come back to that in a moment. I want to focus on acetyl-CoA. More importantly, I want to focus on how it is produced in the cell. Okay, so where does acetyl-CoA come from? How does the cell produce it? There are three main pathways we're going to talk about. Acetyl-CoA can be made from the breakdown of glucose, which is then made into pyruvate through glycolysis, and then pyruvate is converted into acetyl-CoA. Secondly, we can take fats, or rather our cells can take fats, and they can break that down into fatty acids, and those fatty acids can be converted into acetyl-CoA. And lastly, proteins can be metabolized into amino acids, and those amino acids can then be converted into acetyl-CoA. We're going to talk about each of these. We're going to talk mainly about the first step here, the first example, and then we'll spend a little time talking about fatty acids, and then even less time talking about amino acids. But we'll talk a little bit about all three of them. So I'm going to draw a mitochondria. The conversion of these three substrates into acetyl-CoA occurs in the mitochondrion, and the cystic acid cycle occurs in the mitochondrion. Now remember, in the cytoplasm, glucose is converted into pyruvate through glycolysis. Pyruvate then crosses the mitochondrial membranes and enters into the matrix of the mitochondrion. Let's go ahead and take a moment here to label the parts of the mitochondrion, just so we're familiar with them. The inside of the mitochondrion, the lumen of it, is called the matrix. This membrane on the inside is called the inner membrane. This one on the outside is cleverly called the outer membrane. And this space in between the two membranes is called the inner membrane space. For today, we're going to be mainly focusing on what's happening inside of the matrix. So pyruvate enters the matrix, and I'm going to draw the chemical form of it now. So CH3, carbon, and the oxygen molecules. This is then converted into acetyl-CoA. And it's done so using this enzyme called pyruvate decarboxylase. Because it's removing this carboxyl group here, adding this coenzyme A. Okay, so let's write this as acetyl coenzyme A, just to make sure we're staying on the same page, and this as pyruvate. The byproducts of this reaction are also important. Make CO2 and NADH. The CO2 is just a waste product that's released from the cell, and the CO2 is then released from the cell. NADH will then go into the electron transport chain, or be used in the electron transport chain, which is in the inner membrane here. So let me just write that down here, electron transport. The acetyl-CoA will then be used and taken into the citric acid cycle, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Next, I want to explain how fatty acids are converted into acetyl-CoA. In the cytoplasm, fats are broken down into fatty acids. These fatty acids are then taken into the mitochondrion. Fatty acids are converted into 
a fatty acid CoA. And then the fatty acid CoA is converted into acetyl-CoA. And then this can be taken into the citric acid cycle, which we'll talk about in a moment. During the conversion into acetyl-CoA, this process generates NADH and FADH2. Both of these are activated carriers, which will deliver electrons into electron transport, whereby they will generate a considerable amount of energy. Now remember, these fatty acids that are coming into this system here can contain many hydrocarbons, 16, 18, 20. During this process, we're just removing two. So what happens is this fatty acid CoA will continuously remove two hydrocarbons to produce acetyl-CoA. And it'll keep doing this reaction until all the carbons in this chain, or in these chains, are converted into the two-carbon acetyl-CoA. So you can see how, by the breakdown of fatty acids, we can generate a great deal of NADH and FADH2. We call this process of going from fatty acid CoA, or ultimately fatty acids, to acetyl-CoA as beta oxidation. Okay, next we're going to talk about how amino acids are converted into acetyl-CoA. And I don't want to say too much about this except just this little bit. Proteins in the cytoplasm can be broken down into amino acids. These amino acids can enter into the cell, I'm sorry, enter into the mitochondria. These amino acids can then be converted into acetyl-CoA, or in some cases, other citric acid cycle intermediates. I just really want you to know that amino acids are one of the molecules get, that can be converted into acetyl-CoA. Now, if this were a bacterium, this would be the cytoplasm. This would be the inner membrane of the bacterium. This would be the outer membrane of the bacterium. So you can see how bacteria, just like the mitochondria, utilize this space and the membranes to produce energy for that cell in much the same way that the mitochondrion does in eukaryotes. Okay, so we just made acetyl-CoA on the previous whiteboard. Now what are we gonna do with it? Well, acetyl-CoA can be used as a substrate for many reactions in the cell, but in this case, we're going to use it in the citric acid cycle. Now I drew this as a circle because this is a cycle. It's not like glycolysis where it's a series of reactions. And we'll talk about why it's a cycle in a moment. The citric acid cycle produces several things. It produces CO2, it produces water, and these two are byproducts of the reactions. And it also generates GTP and NADH and FADH2. CO2 and water are eliminated. GTP is converted into ATP. The terminal phosphate group on GTP is transferred to ADP to produce ATP. NADH and FADH2, they move to the inner membrane where they transport their electrons to the ultimate process of generating more ATP through oxidative phosphorylation. Though I haven't said it before, but I'll say it now, and we'll come back to this when we talk about electron transport. After they've donated their electrons, it generates NAD plus and FAD plus. These are necessary to be regenerated so it can be recycled and go back into the citric acid cycle. If they weren't, then the citric acid cycle would stop and you would make more NADH or FADH2, and that would be detrimental to the cell. I think it's appropriate now to talk about a misconception. We know that to go from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA through electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation, that oxygen is required. We need it specifically for oxidative phosphorylation where it acts as that final electron acceptor to generate water, but it's also required for this citric acid cycle. We know the citric acid cycle will stop without oxygen. And there is this misconception that oxygen is used to produce carbon dioxide. This turns out to be false. 
This Cl2 is actually made by using the oxygen from another water molecule. So why is oxygen needed? Well, oxygen is needed in electron transport. And as I just said, it produces NAD plus and FAD plus. So oxygen is required for the citric acid cycle so that we can regenerate NAD plus and FAD plus for the citric acid cycle. If you didn't have oxygen, you would not be able to have the electron transport proceed with oxidative phosphorylation to use the NADH and to recycle NAD plus and FAD plus back to the citric acid cycle. So it needs oxygen in an indirect role, but a very important role. Now I want to say just a little something about these enzymes that we find in the citric acid cycle and ultimately in oxidative phosphorylation. And I want to talk about their evolution. So citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation enzymes are about one to two billion years old. Those enzymes have been around from, for one to two billion years. And we know that because this is when oxygen appeared on Earth. So it's reasonable to assume that when oxygen appeared on Earth, organisms adapted to the presence of this potentially toxic chemical. They adapted to use it. We know that life started about three and a half billion years ago. So for the most of that time of life, there was no oxygen consumption. There was no need for these enzymes. All life existed due to anaerobic metabolism. It wasn't until oxygen appeared, like I said, one to two billion years ago, that organisms needed to metabolize it, respond to it, so they were, were not poisoned by it. Okay, now I want to spend a little bit more time with the citric acid cycle and talk about it in greater detail. I'm going to start with oxal acetate. Oxal acetate is four carbons long. It's going to interact with acetyl-CoA. It's going to generate coenzyme A in the process, but as we begin the citric acid cycle, it's going to generate our first product, citrate. The four carbons from oxal acetate and the two carbons from acetyl-CoA gives us a six carbon molecule. Citrate is then converted into, into alpha keto glutarate. This produces CO2 plus NADH. We just lost that carbon from the citrate to make the CO2, so now we're down to a five carbon molecule in alpha keto glutarate. Alpha keto glutarate is then converted into succinyl CoA. In this process, we generate another CO2 and another NADH. Because we're gener generating the CO2, we're losing a carbon here, so succinyl CoA is only four carbons. Succinyl CoA is then converted into succinate. In the production of succinate here, we make one GTP molecule which, as I said before, can be converted into an ATP. Succinate, since we didn't create a carbon dioxide, it is still four carbons. Succinate is then converted into fumarate. This reaction produces FADH2. Fumarate is then converted into malate. I should have mentioned and forgot to, but fumarate is also four carbons because we didn't lose any carbons in the production of FADH2. Making malate also keeps it at four carbons. Now malate is converted back into oxal acetate, and in this process, it generates one NADH. And now we come back to the idea of why we call this a cycle, and it's not just a linear set of pathways. It's a cycle because we start off with oxal acetate, and we end with oxal acetate. If we didn't have the production of oxal acetate at the end, the cycle would not continue. So it's important that we begin and end with the same type of molecule so that the citric acid cycle can continue. Now we spend a little bit of time talking about these intermediates. These intermediates can be used to synthesize other organic molecules. I didn't mention it in earlier, but glycolysis is the same way. 
some of the intermediates of glycolysis can be used to make amino acids and nucle nucleotides. But let's just focus right now on these intermediates of the citric acid cycle. For instance, citrate can in enter into a pathway to produce cholesterol and fatty acids. Alpha-ketoglutarate can enter into pathways to produce glutamic acid, other amino acids, but mainly glu glutamic acid, and it can help make purines, like guanines and adenines. Succinyl-CoA, it can be used to make heme, as well as chlorophyll. And lastly, I'm going to come all the way up here and talk about oxalacetate. It can be used to make aspartic acid, as well as some other amino acids. It can also be used to make purines and pyrimidines. And the reason I point this out is to sh stress how highly regulated all the biochemical activities are occurring in our cells. Hundreds of reactions occur, yet they have to remain completely balanced. The cell has to regulate what to do with citrate. Does it make cholesterol, fatty acids, or is it used in the citric acid cycle? Same thing with alpha-ketoglutarate. Do we make glutamic acids with it, purines, or does it continue in the citric acid cycle? All of these are highly regulated. And this is only a subfraction of the reactions that occur. And this is only one tiny part of the cell within the mitochondrial matrix. So as you move forward with cell biology and um, hopefully a biochemistry course, you'll begin to recognize how remarkable it is that these enzymes are regulated correctly to produce the desired um, homeostasis within the cells. Okay, before we move on to the last topic of gluconeogenesis, I want to give a quick summary of the citric acid cycle. Before we can enter into the citric acid cycle, pyruvate must be converted into acetyl-CoA. In this process though, two CO2s are released and two NADHs are generated. This acetyl-CoA then, as we said, enters into, into the citric acid cycle. Throughout the process of oxalacetate generating citrate and then ultimately ending with oxalacetate again, two CO2s are made, three NADH molecules are made, one FADH2 molecules are made, GTP, which is converted into ATP, is made at one step. And then I'm going to put this down as a product too, because as we said earlier, it's important to keep the cycle going. So at the end of it, we make oxaloacetate. And as I look at this, I forgot to say something here. I said two CO2s and two NADHs, but that's only because we start with two pyruvates. Because remember, from one molecule of glucose, you make two pyruvates. And these pyruvates, then together, both of them create two CO2s and two NADHs. This citric acid cycle, remember, from one glucose molecule, you get two turns, so to speak, of the citric acid cycle. Because you make two pyruvates, each of the pyruvates in the citric acid cycle once. And so, one glucose molecule, you get two turns of the citric acid cycle.